Hey everyone, we are doing a special giveaway to celebrate our one year anniversary of the podcast. That's right, Fishing the DMV is one year old. It's pretty exciting. And to celebrate the occasion, we're giving away a fishing trip with Travis Eden of Kingfisher Guide Services. He operates out of the Shenandoah River and the Upper Potomac River. And we're giving you four unique ways that you can try to win an opportunity to fish with him. Number one, all online orders with Jake's Bait and Tackle. Go to Jake's Bait and Tackle website, whatever you order, in the comments section of your order, just put the hashtag fishing the DMV and you enter a chance to win. Number two, all orders in person. Just go to the store and say you'd like to enter the contest. Again, hashtag fishing the DMV. That's two ways. Number three, if you don't have any money, if you're one of my younger audience, because I know I have a lot of kids that listen to the podcast, I'm giving you two ways that you can do it that's absolutely free. Go to Apple Podcasts and leave a review of Fishing the DMV podcast. And at the end of your review, just put the hashtag Fishing the DMV and you had a chance to win. Now, I'm going to give you a fourth way that you can enter the competition. On every video that drops from November 15th to December 15th, every new video that, that's on the channel, in the comments section, just put the hashtag Fishing the DMV. Now, here's a caveat. It's every video. So if you miss one video, I'm not going to be able to count you. But it's free. All you got to do is in every new video from November 15th to December 15th, in the comment section, just leave the hashtag fishing the DMV and you have a chance to win. So four ways if you want to make an order online and leave the hashtag fishing the DMV. Go to Jake's Bait and Tackle in person and tell them hashtag fishing the DMV. Number three, leave a review of the podcast on Apple podcast with the hashtag fishing the DMV. And number four, on every new video that drops from December I'm sorry, from November 15th to December 15th, leave the hashtag fishing the DMV in the comments section, and that gives you four unique opportunities to win. The contest winner will be announced Saturday, December 17th at Jake's Bait and Tackle's All Day Christmas Seminar Bash. Again, contest winner will be announced December 17th, that Saturday, at Jake's Bait and Tackle's Christmas Seminar Bash. Good luck. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens, and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And tonight we have a really, really special guest. We have Justin Pittman. Uh, he is he has a really cool story. He is the owner and operator of multiple fly fishing and tackle shops, and he continues to grow. And I was really fortunate enough tonight to have him on the show to talk about not only the, the fly fishing opportunities, in this area, but also expand on that to trout and maybe some other species as well. How are you doing tonight, Justin? Good. Thanks so much for having us. No, absolutely. I mean, we were talking a little bit before the show and, and our prior phone calls just, you know, about your business model. And, and before I really want to get into that, what got you, it, it, if you had show and tell in first grade and you had all the different jobs lined up there that your parents want you to do, very few people would say like, I want my son just to own three or four tackle shops unless maybe your name is Johnny Morris. So sure. was this like always your dream of doing this or did it kind of fall in? Like, how did it all come about? No, it, it kind of fell into place. So um, I'm a retired probation officer for youth, uh, did 20 cool. years in uh, juvenile probation here in the Pennsylvania area. And um, it really came about, I was highly involved with uh, the Cumberland Valley Trout Unlimited chapter here. Um, not long after I got out of college, I joined the board um, and in my early 30s, I became the president of Cumberland Valley CBTU. And um, <clears throat> there was a gentleman on the board that owned a company called Holly Flies. And Holly Flies was a distributor of flies to fly fishing shops, um, hardware stores, you name it, all across the country. Uh, it's actually one of the oldest, one of the oldest uh, wholesale fly distributors in the country. Hmm. Um, I used to tell him all the time I wanted to buy that. And uh, just never came came out. So shortly, uh, many years after he had left the board, he was the treasurer while I was the um, president. He left the board and a couple years later called me and said, hey, you ready to buy that uh, company? And I, at the time, uh, my wife and I were you know, starting a family and all that. And I kind of blew it off and said no. Well, long story short, we ended up buying um, Holly Flies. And my wife and I ran that out of our basement. My wife's a, my wife's a vice principal now, but at the time was a teacher. Um, How did that, that conversation right. go down? <laughs> my my this wife is my plan. has been very, yeah, my wife's been very supportive of all these ventures and 
has tolerated, you know, a lot. But yeah, so uh, we ran Holly Flies out of our basement. We have a large uh, uh, finished third floor basement. And um, we had the person that worked for Paul full time worked for us again. And we did that for about five years till my kids were starting to get older. And eventually it was just, it needed to get out of the house. Um, so we found the location in Mount Holly. And at the time I kind of said, if you look at a lot of the um, wholesale fly companies across the country, there's a lot, Solitude and Pack Fly and Catch, Umpqua, Orvis. A lot of them have sister companies that um, sell online as a sister company direct to consumer. And uh, I started that. So that's kind of how Precision Fly, it, it initially started as Precision Fly Fishing. Mm. And um, my wife and I, I said something to my wife and about going out to a show in Michigan, I think back in 2017, uh, one, we did one of the Michigan fly shows. We went out there, uh, pretty much with flies, some fly boxes and some hooks uh, that were repackaged from my distributor. And um, <clears throat> we did well. On the way back, I said to my wife, you know, what would you think about opening up a fly shop? Um, just see if we can pay the bills, keep the lights on. Um, we have, you know, at the time we had another great fly shop in our area. And uh, we opened up a shop where Holly Flies was based out. It was pretty small. Um, it expanded. We, we decided for me um, that clothing and that uh, what I would call lifestyle brands was not the avenue that I wanted to take. And that's, how, that's kind of how the tackle side came about. We knew that we weren't going to be hard in like Patagonia and Sims and clothing at the time. Um, so we went tackle and there's no tackle dealers in the Carlisle area anymore, mm -hmm. Carlisle area. So we went tackle that, that kind of took off slowly. We, I was more known for fly fishing, obviously. And um, it, it all kind of grew uh, within about a year. About a year after being open, um, I was approached about opening a second store in the Lancaster County PA market. Um, wow. Yeah. And so we waited about the, on year two, we started to get the ball rolling on that. There used to be a fly shop in the Lancaster County area called the Evening Rise. Um, and they had shut down about nine years prior to us opening. We actually ended up opening up in almost the exact same location nine years later. Um, and it actually worked out. Now that is only a fly, uh, fly operation there. It is in Mannheim township. So it's a much different, um, market than what we see here in my Carlisle market, you know, in Carlisle, we are on Mount Holly Springs, but we're two, three miles outside of Carlisle. We sit on mountain Creek. Um, we're surrounded by the breaches in three different directions. We're about oh, cool. anywhere. Yeah. Between a half a mile to a mile in three different locations on the breaches. And then we got the Conagawinet, which is a, you know, a small local bass fishery, also with a migrating trout um, in the fall. But then, you know, we're we're 25 to 30 minutes from the Susquehanna and about an hour from the Juniata. Um, so we we saw that we had a strong bass market and on both the tackle and fly side. The fly side grew much faster. Um, the tackle has grown slowly, but has really started to take off. And then in 2021, I was uh, working with James, the uh, former owner of <clears throat> Beaver Creek Fly Shop in Hagerstown, Maryland. And um, we, over uh, the course of about a year, uh, we ended up buying out uh, Beaver Creek Fly Shop in Hagerstown. Uh, I think that was in August of 21. So we, you know, we now have three locations, two in Pennsylvania, one in Maryland. And um in January of this upcoming year of 2023, we should be um, up in uh, full operation in a full tackle um, market there as well. We're taking over two of the other existing buildings on the property, and we should have, we take over the buildings uh, November 15th. Uh, we figure it'll take us about a month and a half to get everything racked out and start getting most of the inventory up from a lot of our suppliers so so making sure the timetable is right when was your when did you open up your second store year um second store opened uh right in the middle of covid in february oh of 2020 <laughs> so we opened uh, the first week of february 2020 and three weeks later um the governor announced all non-essential businesses 
Um, we're closed to walk-in traffic. So uh, three weeks after opening, we uh, shut completely down to walk-in traffic. And that was a blessing and a curse. Um, you know, my stress level, as uh, my wife will tell you, and many of our employees at the time, went through the roof because, oh, yeah. you know, we were we're a new we're still a new operation. Um, you know, we're still battling a lot of the you know new things to, you know, being new in the in the, the flying tackle world, which is a tough industry. But um, what it allowed us to do was really fine tune and become a better online operation. Uh, we run a pretty advanced POS system and that, again, it allowed us to work out all the bugs of our online because online became the dominant form for uh, consumers to purchase things. And um, it really helped us. It really made us see what we were doing poorly with online um, and it allowed us time to fix it. And it, it has made us better overall um, from a, for customers and from a retailer standpoint. You, you touched on this a little bit, but, you know, as a business owner myself and, you know, I had another business that was really clientele based when, when, when the COVID hit, I, like how, I don't know, how did you do it? Like the fact that you started a business or the second, the second, uh, area during COVID, and then you were able now in 2021 to pick up another location. I mean, I think it's a testimony to you and how, how you do everything, but I can't believe you still have hair on your head. Like that's absolutely insane. Like the amount of stress that goes into that. Um, and I want to pick that back onto, I saw in some other tackle shops that outdoor industries did extremely well in COVID. It's so crazy how some industries just died on the vine, but others exploded. Did you see that? And how has the market rebounded since then? We, we did see that. Um, 2020 and 2021, uh, I think everybody that had something in the outdoor industry that required you to be outside um, did well. It was a catch-22. So what happened was we were selling um, a lot of stuff. However, we couldn't get a lot of stuff. So what that, And that was another thing that allowed, I think, dealers across the country, it made you think outside the box. It made you become... Um, better at what you do because one, you had to have good relationships with your dealers um, or your suppliers. And, and one thing to understand in the fly and tackle world, there's two different roles in the fly world. Almost everything's bought direct. If you're a big enough buyer or, or, or dealer, you buy direct in the, in the tackle world, that conventional world, it's much different. Everything, you know, we do buy direct with our bigger companies like Daiwa and Luz and Shimano and, and those co companies, but you also have to su survive on third party companies and your, your third party distributors. And that doesn't exist in the fly world. So what it made us do and where I think we're improving now. And even my biggest struggle is our buying management programs is how do we buy responsibly and be more effective? Because as you know, in the tackle world, you can, you can spend a lot of money in soft plastics mm -hmm. and that stands true in the fly tying world too. And, you know, you walk in any one of our three fly shops and they're very diverse, but from the customer base at Beaver Creek to the customer base at our Lancaster store. So it has made us utilize the systems that we're paying, you know, money for and these POS systems that, um, that are God awfully expensive, but it's making us use them. It's making us look at the data. It's making us say, okay, like customers in Beaver Creek are asking for this, but customers in Lancaster um, don't. And I'll give you a prime example, um, eight and a half foot four weight fly rods. I can't give an eight and a half foot four weight fly rod away at my Lancaster store. I just hmm. can't. At my Beaver Creek store, it's my number one seller. And a lot of it is you look at your water demographic. A lot of our customer base there you know, tends to fish, say, the, the Beaver Creek or um, certain parts of the Antietam or, you know, smaller freestone based streams in that market. And um, that just seems to be the rod of choice. Um, but if you come to my Holly store, the number one rod for us uh, is a 10 foot three weight. I mean, we are a huge Euro uh, shop. I mean, it's a big it's a big thing for us. And I mean, I sell more 10 foot three weights out of my holly store than I do nine foot five weights. So 
where does where does the craze in fly fishing start when you think of like so i'll give bass fishing as a great example it goes mm -hmm. if kevin van dam or a content creator wins or pitches something then it goes from him to the manufacturer then to then to you it's usually trickled down to the customer but it usually starts with somebody like like the kvd pushing the product and then that sets the new trend um, mm -hmm. In the trout fishing world, what really sets the trends that you have to keep an eye on, keep your, your thumb, thumb on the pulse? Well, so when you say trout fishing world for me, I do go automatically to the fly. Um, and and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. But in the fly industry, what I see is it's more it's, it's no different than what we see in the tackle. world. And you're right. The tackle world is so based on what's won the latest tournament. Um, what one of the, which one of like the Kevin Van Dams or one of the superstars in the uh, Bassmasters is pushing. I, I definitely agree there that that dictates sales for us. We have to stay on top of that, especially like if we watch Tackle Trader magazine and things like that, that really can dictate what the next hottest bait or soft mm. plastic or crankbait is going to be. But in the fly world, it, it really is by the person. So, you know, it's fun. Podcast rule. Um, in my opinion, in the fly industry, I, I will say that. And there's a couple big names, you know, throughout fly. And obviously, you know, your Joe Humphreys, your George Daniels, um, you know, a new up and comer. And one of, in my opinion, one of the top Euro nymph fishermen right now in the country is a young man out of Pennsylvania, Josh Miller. He's out of the Pittsburgh area, Team USA. Um, and it, a lot of it's trends. So like right now, you over the last, I want to say four to five years, maybe not quite that long, Euronymphine has been probably the hottest trend in fly fishing. And I would say follow that by your, um, what I consider um, bass, musky, um, and the up and coming, in my opinion, especially in the Maryland market, we see more in Maryland, Virginia is, is snakehead. But I mm -hmm. think in the trout world, it's really based upon um, – you know, what some of those bloggers, your podcasters or your your influencers like your your local celebrities like your George Andrews, Devin Olson, your Josh. Mm, okay. What what are they doing? How are they fishing? What type of flies? Um, you know, we tell people all the time. YouTube is probably the best instructor in the world. You can go on there and literally find any pattern variation, um, style of casting review on any piece of gear in the world. Um and I do see more, like if you look at gear reviews, there is 10 times more gear reviews on fly fishing gear than there is tackle gear. I just feel like uh, for some reason, fly fishermen are fanatic about like reviewing a product a billion times before they pull the trigger on it. Um, and we, we see a lot of guys that come in on our bass side, especially that, you know, whatever's big in that tournament market, that tournament circle, that's what they're buying. Uh, like, the, uh, for example, like that, uh, the St. Croix Victory Series rod, you know, that popped out to the market, uh, I think, uh, early last year. Um, it's been in the hands of a lot of tournament anglers. It's been in that circuit. It's It's been blogged about. It's been talked about. It's for me, it's our number one selling bass related rod in our store. A year and a half ago, the Daiwa Tatulas, we couldn't keep them on the shelf. Mm -hmm. So it, it's it's just really funny how the trends transition how much of the market do you think and this is i think topical for me because i got to go down uh, to icast this year in orlando mm -hmm. for media and i didn't i couldn't believe how much of it was bass fishing community like how much money is in there it is it's stupid it's absolutely mm -hmm. stupid how much of the market's eaten up with that but then you have mm -hmm. some saltwater niches but then you also have the fly guys how much mm -hmm. of the market is made up of fly guys when you just talk about this whole umbrella that we call trying to catch a fish <laughs> well, I'm, I'm the wrong person to ask because if you took like a Susquehanna fishing tackle, um, you know, they, they do a fantastic job. Um, mm -hmm. They are 100% of the bass world. Um, for me, um, you know, fly dominates us, but would I say the biggest majority of spenders in the tack in the fishing community are bass? Absolutely. Um, and, and you'll see, that's one of the reasons that, you know, my team and, and I got guys and gals on staff that are solely focused on the research behind and what we need to do to become one of the top bass and tackle operations in Pennsylvania, Maryland. Um, you know, we're committed to it. It's where our largest funding is going in 23 and 24 is to our tackle base. Um, if we open another operation in Pennsylvania or somewhere else, 
we will not open unless it has a tackle fly component. Mm -hmm. You, you got to, you almost have to round out the portfolio there. Um, mm -hmm. And the reason I bring that up is, and this is a, this is the topic I really wanted to get into next was the difference between, I think the bass community and the trout community when it comes to conservation. Cause I truly think that the trout guys have their shit together when it comes to trout unlimited, when the, you can get a group of guys out there to work on a stream, you can get the money donated to fix your local fisheries. Bass guys will just bitch and buy products, but they're not willing to go that extra step. I think at least from what I've seen from being on the bass side of things to like, Hey, the, the river, the Shenandoah debacle that happened back in the early two thousands example of that, it took something extremely grave for the bass fishing community to get together. And I guess my question is, why is it the trout community? You guys are just so damn good at taking care of your waters. Like, where does that come from? You know, I wish I had an answer for that. And we talk about this at the Mount. I'm located at my Mount Holly store. So when I say that, that's where I'm at. That I live close to there. Um, we talk about this all the time. I do think, well, one, I think Trout Unlimited has <clears throat> put a, obviously a large focus on cold water conservation. I think that has been such a strong ongoing commitment um, in many societies across America that it's that that hold is just deep and it runs super deep. I think what we are starting to see even locally in the bass community and I think and I want to say in the fishing communities in general, um, I see more generations and even the younger generations finding a stronger appreciation for conservation. Um, we got a lot of bass guys, what I call bass guys on the tackle side that are very focused and tuned in to like the conservation. And we're starting to see it. I think one of the biggest reasons you don't see more of a hold. And I think, I think like the bass masters and some of these bigger organizations would jump on board is there's not essentially a designated organization that I know of that's designated to essentially what I would say warm water protection. So protecting those warm water uh, ways, like, you know, in your area, the Potomac, the Susquehanna, you know, the Susquehanna gets a lot of attention here in Pennsylvania. It's, it is the lifeblood of that central PA market. It, it's, it's such a tremendous fishery that mm -hmm. has seen its ups and downs over the years. And I mean, any research you do, you can see the fish and boat commission um, definitely has its eyes on it and has, and I think if you really pay attention, you know, Bob Clouser, um, you know, many years back had a strong push um, for cleaning up the Susquehanna. And, you know, guides like Brian Shoemaker um, and some of those guides, they pushed hard for conservation for the Susquehanna. And I do believe if the what I call the bass angling community of the conventional um, tackle side had an organization that led a charge. Um, and their mission was focused on conservation towards, you know, warm waters. Um, I, I, I think, I think those anglers would jump on board. No, I, I think so too, because they have to understand that there's no, there's no new reservoirs being built. We only have the waters that we have. And, and again, like, like guys, like my, like my logo says, this is the greater DMV area. And we had uh, the Matt Sell interview would probably have dropped by then. And he's the manager of the D of Maryland DNR. And we talked about this at length off, off the show that like the ring of metropolis is growing. And before you know it, like a lot of Maryland, a lot of Virginia is just going to be houses. And we only have so many waterways that we're really going to have to protect here. And I think there's a lot that we could learn from Trout Unlimited about how we can better do that for warm water species as well. And, and you said about protection, too. It's like it's like the snakehead and the flathead. And like there's so much controversy. I know Susquehanna, like you don't drop anything about flatheads on there because you're going to get death, death threats. I learned that the hard way. But um, like even the snakeheads where 10 years ago, it's like we have to kill them all. And now there's a cult of personality around mm -hmm. snakeheads. Like it is it's stupid how much that's grown. Um, mm -hmm. But you're right. This controversy, the the the, the, the um, being able to, to husband this resource is just so freaking important. Um, what you talked about this a little bit um, about different species besides trout. What are some other segments that are growing for you? Is it bass? Is it snakehead, musky? That that um, are so, <laughs> you know, the, our biggest target is obviously the bass because it's such a large a group of anglers. But a small target, and I will say. Um, we don't have it yet in the Pennsylvania market. I mean, we have it. It hasn't taken off yet. But th I think the snakehead market in the Maryland, Virginia market is almost that untalked about market. 
You know, mm-hmm. musky is definitely always been there. Musky's grown. We are definitely seeing a bigger musky push, both in conventional and fly. What I will give the musky and snakehead anglers credit, they are very close to the um, hip with their information. It's not something they want to share. And I understand that. Um, it is a smaller community of anglers, but it's a it's a growing community of anglers. We're we're um, constantly, especially out of our Maryland store, and that you know goes back to even our time practices at different stores. We see a lot more um, big game um, requests for not only hooks but feathers and fur, um, and a lot of that's going towards muskie and snakehead. You know, one of our biggest focuses from an educational standpoint from the shop is to start doing more educational based presentations on snakehead and musky in that Maryland, um, almost that whole demographic of what you have that Northern Virginia, uh, Maryland, lower Pennsylvania market, because it's, it's a, it's a fishery. It's a, a species that I think, especially for your diehard trout guys, and you probably have talked to other um, guests about this, but you know, for me as a diehard trout angler, you know, if you do care about the trout, if you are conservation driven to an extent, um, you you do have to buy warm water in, in Maryland, Pennsylvania. That that is our biggest, biggest battle is, you know, once we hit that early mid June, um, a lot of our freestone streams are warming up. And I definitely am seeing that um, turn from the traditional anger, especially our Pennsylvania market. We have a lot of old school traditional anglers. We are seeing a lot more of those anglers starting to migrate and, and realize they're not putting the fly rods away um, that second week of June. These anglers are chasing bass. These anglers are chasing musky. These anglers are traveling now to chase snakehead because they see that it's an aggressive fish. It's a great angling opportunity. Um, they can do it on a lot of the same gear that they're fishing for bass. Um, and it had not musky per se, but especially the snakehead. Um, and we're starting to see a lot more anglers do it. One thing that we have found, um, even in our Trout Unlimited banquets, you know, um, as I said earlier, I've been the vice president, president in different roles over many of the years. One of the things that um, raises some of the most money in some of our online auctions is trips that are warm water. Um, really? Banquets. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, we have a couple local guides that donate um well, lots of guides, but donate local trips. Um, and some of the trips that bring the highest amount of money are trips that aren't based around trout. It's our it's our float trips on the Juniata or Susquehanna for bass. Uh, it's stuff coming out of Maryland uh, for muskie and bass. So a lot of those trips that are at Trout Unlimited Banquets, our highest bids are on warm water uh, fish. It- how much of that, because I, I saw this a lot of examples like the kayak boom, where you saw people catching sharks out of kayaks in the ocean and that became popular. Sure. How much of it is, and for a better word, boredom of catching the same thing and also social media of seeing this guy on a fly rod catch a, you know, a 60, a 60 inch musky. Is it a little bit of both that you're seeing more of now? Well, you're asking the wrong, I'm a gear junkie and I watch about a hundred. I mean, I'll watch a YouTube video on a shirt review before I, buy it. so I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm terrible. <laughs> I, I drive my wife insane. Like I will, I will review and watch videos on everything. I think that is part of it. I mean, I think for, um, I put myself and some of my fishing buddies in that, that same boat. I mean, I love gear. I love buying gear. Um, I love it. And I buy it sometimes and don't even get to use it right away. But, um, I think, I think it is trendy. I mean, I do think that your traditional trout angler is starting to see that if you could, especially your PA guys, cause that's what I know more, mm-hmm. but if I can catch, you know, some of these picky brown trout and brook trout on some of these streams, especially your brown trout, you know, why not chase these fighting, big fighting mm-hmm. smallmouth bass and, and snakehead and, and, down in that Potomac market, you know, you got a great musky fishery down there. Um, the lower Susquehanna, great musky fishery. And um, I can't speak for Maryland, but I can speak for the, you know, PA Fish and Boat Commission has done a great job with their stocking program of the tiger musky and a lot of our local warm water streams from Perry, Cumberland, Dolphin County. Um, a lot of what you guys are seeing down there in the uh, that Franklin County, York County line that borders that Maryland line. And 
just some outstanding musky opportunity. Yeah, and one that I want to make sure because I know I'm going to get killed in the comments section. Rob mentioned this is going after basically the 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 sewer bonefish, which is was really huge during Brood X, which is carp off a of fly rod. I mean, it was nuts when when the cicada hatch happened, where you're seeing guys on fly catch like 60 pound carp mm -hmm. on top water. Basically, it's it's nuts, but. Yeah, like that thing tugs really hard and it's everywhere. And it's almost like you can create a brand new marketplace. And then, of course, pike fishery in Deep Creek Lake, which as of now, you know, the Matt Sell interview guys has already dropped. Go check that out where they're predicting that that will be the number one pike fishery, you know, mm -hmm. as, as far south as possible. And all this is right here in the Maryland, PA and, and Virginia area. Yeah, I, I listen. <laughs> if you go to our website and look at one of our guides, one of our guides just targets tar carp. Um, really? Really? <laughs> Absolutely. And he, he's, uh, he's, uh, he works out of my Lancaster store. He's my, um, web buying and manager. And, um, I mean, he's targeting, you know, he's targeting bass too, but I mean, we run dedicated trips just for carp. And, um, I think it's, and people don't realize like they're hard, they're hard to catch. Like you said, they, they fight like hell. It's, it's a fantastic, uh, um, game fish and it's overlooked. It's overshadowed. And, a lot of people realize that, you know, a lot of streams that have strong carp populations um, will tell you that that's the sign of a very healthy stream. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people don't realize that, but that's the sign of a very healthy uh, waterway. So, yeah, I mean, Maryland is, in my opinion, we, we talk about this. And that was one of the reasons, you know, we, we were we looked hard at the Beaver Creek location. Uh, we had we had talked to James quite a bit about it is. You know, if you look at Pennsylvania, as you know, there's fly shops and tackle shops everywhere. You know, we have guides coming out of, of every corner, um, especially in that fly world. But, you know, Maryland's an um, overlooked state. Um, mm. you, there, you guys have a lot of great water. You have a lot of diversity, everything from that ocean side, everything from, you know, your north branch of the Potomac to, like you said, Deep Creek Lake. Um, and there's a lot of waterways in between. What, what you didn't have was a lot of tackle and fly shops. And um, that was kind of one of the reasons we looked at that market. We knew it would be tough. Um, we, we knew it was going to be a tough market to try to tap into. But um, why do you think that? It cool. just I think it sometimes gets over outshadowed by like that Pennsylvania market. You know, there's so much water in Pennsylvania. There's so much fishing opportunity. Um, and then the trout market in Pennsylvania, I feel like just outshines Maryland in some ways. Um, and we do, we get a lot of Maryland anglers, um, especially at my Mount Holly Springs location. We were inundated with Maryland anglers, which is good. Um, but Maryland just felt like it was overlooked. And, um, you know, when you look across the state that of like solid tackle and fly shops, there's some, but there's not many. Um, so that's kind of why we, we knew when we took over um, Beaver Creek that our goal was to add tackle. It just took us about a year longer to secure the buildings um, to the left and right of the shop than we anticipated. But uh, we finally were able to get them. And um, I, I really think it's going to open up a lot of angling and tackle, a lot of opportunity for anglers in Maryland because anglers, especially tackle anglers, at a disadvantage on where to go. Mm -hmm. um, outside of your big box stores. Yeah, that they are. There's just not a lot in this area. And I think really one issue is just, the, I guess, the size of Maryland. You know, after talking to you know, two fine individuals from the Maryland DNR, you know, it's a small state. It really is. It has a lot mm -hmm. of, of availability for you to get out and fish. But on the same time, it's very easy for it to get pressured. And, and looking at the trout areas, you know, and I want to get to PA here eventually too. Mm -hmm. it, is that the problem? Is like, it's such a, there's so few areas compared to PA that people just don't like to talk about the opportunities. They yep. try to keep it hush hush. Is that the vibe? I feel that's the vibe. And, and we want to, we do respect that as a shop. I mean, we definitely, um, we work with some of our local clubs um, at Beaver Creek uh, location, and we do try to respect some of the locations and, and pressure of um, some of the streams there, especially the trout streams. I do think that that's why Pennsylvania, um, gets inundated more uh, with trout is we just have so much water. I mean, the Cumberland Valley, Dolphin County, if you look in that northern tier of Pennsylvania, there is just so many massive freestone streams that, again, some are 
um, primary stock fisheries. But then uh, many of the headwaters of many of those northern tier streams um, are such cold water influences for especially wild brook trout and brown trout that it's incredible. Um, you know, I, my wife and I own a property in the Kettle Creek uh, Valley. And if there's flowing water there, there's typically about a 95% chance there's a wild brook trout in it. Wow. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's amazing. So that like that Clinton, Potter, Tioga County of the part of the state, you know, there's just so much fishing opportunity. Can PA, like, how does pressure affect PA then? Is, is it, is it unpressurable because of how much water you have, or are you ever worried about that? We worry about it all the time. I mean, if you look at the Cumberland Valley where I'm at, um, especially on that yellow breaches, big spring, um, you know, do, does the Latorte get tons of pressure? No, the Latorte's probably one of the most, probably one of the hardest fisheries in the entire country. Um, so the average person is not going to the Latorte to fish. But the yellow breaches, there isn't a day that goes by other than when the season's closed that there isn't someone fishing the breaches. And the catch and release is open year round. Um, I think that stands true for a lot of the Cumberland, Dolphin, and York County areas. The pressure is high. Um, we talk about it all the time, the big spring. Um, it gets tremendous pressure. And then in February, when everything else closes in Pennsylvania, a lot of our limestone uh, catch and release uh, streams just get pounded to death. Um, you know, the one good thing that we do have is, you know, once you do get north of the Cumberland Valley that, you know, what, what I guess you can call the advantage or disadvantage to like that Cumberland Dolphin York is we share a border with Maryland. Um, so we're going to get a lot of uh, out of state traffic in those areas. I mean, for a uh, Maryland resident, say from Hagerstown, they can be on the yellow breaches in 45 minutes to an hour, you know, from somebody on the uh, Baltimore side off of 83. Again, you can be on um, the yellow breaches, lower yellow breaches in 45 minutes to an hour. So, um, and, and, and you're driving past, you're driving past a ton of tr tremendous streams just to and, get to the breaches. And for, for all of our, cause I know we have a huge population of people in Tennessee that listen and they're probably saying like, you're going to drive 30 to 40 minutes to fish. And, and the question is like, yeah, you do. Like, this is the thing about living where we are in the greater DC, Baltimore, metropolitan area. Everyone commutes. Like it, it's mm -hmm. in my old job, I had a 90 minute commute one way. So the idea of then traveling 30 minutes to an hour to go fishing is not a big deal for us. You know, when I fish bass tournaments, you know, our local division local would be Potomac river, Smith mountain, Lake Kerr, and then the upper or bay that's insane amount of driving so when we're talking about these distances guys understand like for us that's normal like we're a very transient community well it's funny you say that because i just had this conversation with my buying manager um the other day like if you walk in the mount holly store in mid-april almost every customer is in waiters because <laughs> it i mean we are there i mean we're they, they pull in they're in waiters they're fishing all day um, they don't take their waiters off because they're literally coming in to buy what I, we consider, you know, the bread and butter items, you know, some type of bait, uh, tippet, leaders, flies, you know, whatever that may be on the flyer tackle side. I mean, they're in waiters. If you go to any of our other stores uh, and, and Beaver Creek, the Beaver Creek location being, you know, a prime example is that is a commuters um, store. Like, even though we do set, you know, 50 feet off the Beaver Creek. A lot outside of our locals from that, you know, surrounding uh, Hagerstown Market, uh, Boonesboro area. A lot of our our fishermen are from your from your area, that DMV, that that um, DC, that Northern Virginia, the outskirts of what I would say that Frederick, Maryland. So it's more mm -hmm. than it's more than you know, just jumping the car and running down the road. The, um, these customers are traveling, so it is so funny because I'm telling you, you come to our shop and and PA and Mount Holly in April. And literally, you know, four out of five customers are standing there in waiting boots. So. And it's a, it's a testimony that you guys pick great locations to be at. Like, I mean, fantastic locations for each of your stores. And I know, I know the one in Maryland, I think it's like right off of 70, you know, off the top Correct. of my head. And so mm -hmm. like, that's perfect. Like, I mean, it's such great locations that you can get to it very easily. Um, you know, and, and speaking about like seasonal stuff, like what do you like to fish for? Like seasonally? Like, I mean, do, are you just all work and no play? 
<laughs> well, so lately I have been. I mean, and, and it's not even all work. I mean, my family's grown. My wife is busy with her job. Our, our, our kids are 11 and 13 and very active in sports. Um, <clears throat> so my fishing has slowed down. Um, right now I'm highly focused on steelhead season. We, we run a tremendous steelhead program. Um, so we have three to four guides that guide 20 days straight in Erie. Uh, so we run that Erie, Ohio market pretty hard. And a lot of my staff loves it. So we have to really pay attention to our scheduling because we have staff in Erie um, from this weekend till the day before Thanksgiving. So, um, yeah, nonstop. So, yeah, I mean, I, I it has been more work lately. I do focus more. Trout has been my obvious, my primary. I will tell you that over the last two years, uh, bass has become a stronger um, pursuit for us. You know, we got into selling rafts here about a year and a half ago. So we we realized that that was a market that was untouched in your market down in Maryland. And even in our market here for um, the Susquehanna Juniata, you know, drift, most of your diehard guides in our area running drift boats. Mm -hmm. But what we noticed was, um, one, the average angler isn't spending 13, 14, 15,000 on uh, a hide or, you know, a clack. So, um we noticed that rafts were blowing up, you know, Flycraft did a great job of blowing up that easy market, that easy um, draft world. And we, we, we looked at it. We thought we'll take the next step into what we considered a, a bigger raft rafts for the weekend warrior rafts for the guides. Um, so that has opened up a lot of bass opportunity for us. So that's, that is my primary focus is to chase more bass, focus more on that streamer popper game and make it simple um, and try to find more time to do it. Do you have like a, a like a bucket list of fish that you want to catch and notch in your belt on our, on a fly rod? Not really. Um, at some point I'll probably track most of them down. My next step is to chase Albie uh, next year in Ooh. Massachusetts. Yeah. We got a couple guys from our shop that run, um, to Connecticut and Massachusetts to chase Albie and, uh, stripers on the fly. So that is, that is something I'd like to do next year. Um, but really that is it for me, it's not about getting there. It's just one, you got to follow the, follow the runs. It's very similar to steelhead fishing. Um, you know, steelhead's good when the water's up right now, Erie's low. They're supposed to get rain on Wednesday. So, you know, the diehards are jumping in their trucks on uh, Thursday morning. They'll be in Erie. So that that's kind of the same game with your um, Albie and stripers is you really got to be tuned into the runs. And when fish are running, you got to be able to jump in the car and go. Um, and for us, for my wife and I, it's, it's not about doing it. It's just, you know, making sure our schedules all align it. We have mm -hmm. someone to help her with, you know, getting kids somewhere because she does handle a lot of that um, and making sure she's not left stranded trying to get one of our two kids to a practice because she does most of it. So the, the life of an entrepreneur. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> How the, many the kids, guides do you kids have? cut into fishing? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, guides. So we have uh, we have some great guides, Mike Hack and um, Tom. I'm just trying to think one, two, three, I think seven, eight guides. We got. Um, yeah probably nine guides total that run wow. for us. Yeah. And that's now, all guides, over PA, right? Yeah. All over PA and Maryland. Um, we have some, so we work out of Maryland. We uh, work with Tom Martin. He runs uh, an unbelievable guide service down there. We subcontract some stuff to him. And then we have Mike Heck. He lives out of Pennsylvania and Rachel Bernard, who uh, lives in Maryland, who's doing a lot of our like close Beaver Creek trout cri trips. And then, Mike, we get a lot of Maryland residents that want to fish the limestone, some of the limestoners of PA. So, yeah, I think we have about four guides that run anywhere between four to five days a week, maybe five guides that run four to five days a week. And then, um, you know, the rest are, you know, hit or miss. Some are like our Erie guides right now. They'll run 22 days straight. Um, and then, you know, our bass guides, they're starting to, they're starting to slow down. So. 
That's the one nice thing though, the way you have it strategized is, is again, like you can do this year round, you know, you, you, you can chase fish on a fly year round. You don't have just to mm-hmm. go after one. And that's, what's so nice about the area that we live in is you have the opportunity, you know, if you live in the Maryland area, you can be in a destination that's prime no matter you know, 12 months mm-hmm. out of the year, which is really awesome. Yeah, you're exactly right. That's, and you know, you said earlier, like one is one is one of the things maybe I need to, I want to improve on or do better. And, um, you know, the saltwater game in Maryland is, you know, for us, it's been my slowest game. Um, and a lot of it is, you know, I, I've based, you know, our business was based around trout and warm water, you know, the bass. And, um, you know, we've committed to myself getting people in the shop that know the salt game. You know, one of the things that we've talked to our staff about, and, you know, we preach is do not, do not talk to somebody. If you don't know an answer, to a question. Don't bullshit somebody. Mm -hmm. Um, It's not good customer service. Just tell them you don't know. Um, We have staff between all three of our stores that I don't want to say are all experts. It's everything, but we have someone that is, you know, an expert in salt. We have, we have warm water experts. We have some of the best trout guides in the country um, working for us. So, you know, if, like I tell my staff and myself included, if I don't have an answer, I'll get you an answer. We'll, we'll get you you know, an answer to it. So. No, that's, that's, that's freaking awesome. Um, you know, and one thing I'll, we forgot to even touch on this was that you actually run a, the trout museum in PA. Well, I'm the vice president. So vice president. I, okay. Yep. Vice president of the PA, uh, uh, fly fishing museum. And currently the vice president, of, uh, Cumberland Valley TU. You are so overwhelmed. It's insane how some, much stuff you have going yes. on in your life. Goodness <laughs> gracious. So how did you get into that? Like the museum gig? Was that just thrown in your lap as well? Because that's um, fascinating. No. Uh, so a lot of, so really what happened is the, the, the PA Fly Fishing Museum, a lot of the volunteers and what I consider the older volunteers were based out of the Cumberland Valley. Um, and, it, and back up for our listeners, and I apologize for cutting you off, you know, sure. like for our Virginia guys and Maryland guys, what is this museum about? Like just a little history of that if they don't know about it. Sure. So the Pennsylvania Fly Fishing Museum is really, um, if if you ask a lot of people, and there's there's many debates on this, but, you know, a lot of people will say that uh, fly fishing was born in either the Cumberland Valley of Pennsylvania or the Catskills in New York. You know, and if you ask different different people, you'll get different answers. But um, the, the Pennsylvania Fly Fishing Museum um, is... It sits right now currently on the Latour um, area on Sh- uh, Shady Lane. And the museum portrays some of the um, anglers, guides, tires, innovators um, that have helped build the sport of fly fishing. So, you know, if you think of like Thomas and Thomas, I, I, I'm i wearing their hat tonight, so it made me think about it. But, um, you know, Thomas and Thomas was born in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. Hmm. Um, you know, Met Tackle is originally from Pennsylvania. And then if you look at some of the most profound tires and anglers and innovators of the sport, a lot of them came from Pennsylvania. Take Joe Humphreys, you know, George Harvey. Um, And within that museum, there's displays of many of our, uh, what we consider famous fly fishermen. And it's not just essentially fly fishermen, it's been industry leaders. It's been people that committed their life to conservation that are in that, that's helped, um, you know, brand the sport. Lefty Cray is in the Pennsylvania Fly Fishing Museum. And, you know, a lot of people will say, well, why why Lefty? Um, um, But he's in there because he had such a large influence on fishing in Pennsylvania. You know, a lot of his roots in fly fishing are in Pennsylvania. Um, So there's, yeah, there, there's so many different anglers. And if you, you know, I encourage a lot of your listeners, if you're ever in that Cumberland Valley area, Google, you know, the PA Fly Fishing Museum, it, it's free. You can go into the museum. The doors are open nine to five. Um, and there's a library in there. And it, it's not huge, but it will really give you a great opportunity to see what some of the anglers and contributors of the sport, where they came from. And, you know, um, what they've been able to provide. And we do have different satellite, um, uh, what we call like little satellite museums across the state, Pittsburgh and Philadelphia and the state college area. And we do share a lot of our um, memorabilia with um, 
the Catskill Museum in New York, which is or uh, Connecticut, which is the largest museum um, in the country. That's the that's the uh, National Fly Fishing Museum, and we do share a lot of our um, pieces with them. Yeah, that's really cool. Like I, I just again, like the thing I love about this thing, this platform that I've created is the fact is just to bring the education to everyone that's not aware of this different tribes. Because the biggest thing I've always said, like we're so tribalistic, where we don't branch across the different tribes. Whether you're cat fisherman, bass fisherman, trout angler, fly guy, and so if you grow up in one tribe, you you almost don't know that there's this whole other world out there. And I had no idea about this Cumberland Museum. And everyone, like mm -hmm. always, everything I talk about today will be linked in the episode description, so you'll be able to find all the links, so you can be able to get to it. Um, I mean, we, we've covered just we've covered so many topics. Is there anything else that you really want to touch base on that we forgot to mention? I don't, I don't think so. I mean, there's, there's so much you could talk about. I mean, I, like you said before, there, there's so much diversity, the area that you cover between Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia, <laughs> there's just, it's insane. it's insane. Like you said, I mean, you know, like one of the things that I think it's overlooked for like your Maryland angler, um, that angler then in the Maryland, Northern Virginia is um, just the steelhead opportunities that are, not that far away for you in that Erie, Ohio corridor. Um, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. The, the fishery is unbelievable. And, you know, for us here in the Cumberland Valley, it's, you know, it's a five hour drive from, for my customers in that Cumberland Valley market, it's a five hour drive to New York, to the Salmon River, Pulaski, or, you know, a five, five and a half hour drive to Erie in Ohio. Um, there's just, there's just so much opportunity, um, to go chase so many different species of fish. Um, and, and really like we tell a lot of our customers, you don't have to be that we can help and um, do it on a budget. Um, you, we can help you spend as much money as you want, if you really want and stay at the nicest places that money will buy. But we, we also, you know, we can, there's so many great and easy places to stay and travel to that. Like you said, within 30 minutes to five mm -hmm. hours, there's, you couldn't do it all in a lifetime. You couldn't cover, you couldn't cover it all in a lifetime. One last thought I want, I want to leave everyone with is, is where do you think the fly industry is going in the next five years w with everything we've been through with COVID, with this induction of, of more customers or more fans of the sport, um, the greater pressure, the evolution of tactics to be able to catch fish that are just insanely pressured. Like where do you see it all going? That's a good question. And, and I, I wish you we wish we had that magic ball to help us with preparing for buying. But, um, you know, I think one of the biggest things that I think is benefits all of us is I think with the, we did see a massive increase in new anglers um, through COVID that's good and bad. That creates a lot of pressure for all of us existing anglers that have been out there. But as a sport, as a whole, I think that it is creating a long lasting, um, ability for people to care about our waterways. You know, if we compare the fishing and hunting world, you know, because even though I sell fishing equipment, we're, we're very closely linked to that ang the hunter as well. Um, and I don't think the hunting market has seen the growth of new hunters that the angling market um, has. And I think the biggest thing, and I, I think probably one of the things that shop owners across the country need to continue to focus on, and they are, is we need one to focus on the diversity of the sport. And I think that you've seen that from industry leaders like Orvis, like Sims. I mean, go back five years ago, Sims would have never in a million years uh, posted an a ad in the Bassmasters. Mm -hmm. Now Sims is one of the leaders, leading sponsors in it. You know, the big industry supporters like Orvis, like Sims, you know, um, I mean, look at Pure Fishing. Um, Pure yeah. Fishing owns Hardy, but they own, you know, a hundred other conglomerates as well. They see that there is an importance for that warm water fishery. I think now as a, like even a shop owner, it helps us as shop owners to diversify our angling market. And I think that younger demographic of anglers that are coming up through, um, and what I say, younger demographic, I we saw a lot of new demographic in that late 20s, early 30s um, as a new angler. I think that 
it's going to touch base on one of the topics that you brought up earlier, and that is the importance of conservation, both for trout, warm water, or whatever that species is. You know, like you said, it, when and snakeheads were initially, you know, started to be talked about, it was if you touch one, you kill it. You mm-hmm. get rid of it. You do not. I mean, you were being fined if you were caught putting it back in the waterway. Um, now there's a lot of controversy on that. You know, states are starting to change the provisions on that. And you know, as a game fish, you know, it's almost become a delicacy uh, as a fish. Um, so I, I think that you're going to see over the next five to ten years, you're going to see a much larger diversity in the fly fishing world. And I think from a tackle, what I say, tackle um, um, world, I think you are going to see more of an emphasis put on um, conservation. I think the Chesapeake Bay um, organizations are really, really doing a great Mm. job at outlining um, with a lot of townships and a local, a lot of local waterways on the importance of runoff, the importance of sediment. And I think as that grows, I mean, look at look, use the Susquehanna as your um, as your stomping ground. Look how much emphasis has been put on the Susquehanna over the last 10 years on um, farming and agriculture and um, sewers and runoff. And it has tremendously changed the way the Susquehanna uh, has been monitored. And the Chesapeake Bay is, you know, highly, highly active with everything that spills into it. Yeah. And I'll add to that too, is depending on where you live, make sure you get in contact with your own river keeper, lake keeper, or your contact for the Chesapeake Bay Association. You know, huge shout out to David Sikorsky, who we had on the show, who runs the Chesapeake Bay Association. You know, it's so vitally important that, you know, for guides and people that spend time on the river, if you see something, say something and reach mm-hmm. out to them, because you can stop bigger problems from happening. Oh, absolutely. And, and as you said before, development is um, not going to be stopped. And it, it, it does come down and we see it from the cold water conservation side, you know, it, that you are right. Cold water does have higher protections than some warm waters. Um, and I can't speak for Maryland because I don't follow everything there. But in Pennsylvania, you know, if it's deemed a cold water fishery, there, there is a lot of regulations that are put in place for development and things like that. But I, I do truly believe that if people pay attention to it, and I do think from your hunters to your anglers, the newer generation and even older are starting to find a greater importance that, you know, they're, they're not making more water. Um, and no. we're going to continue to keep building houses, like you said, and building highways and building roadways. And it is the anglers and outdoorsmen's responsibility to, um, you know, protect what we have. And, you know, as we've seen brook trout for a prime example, they're such a hardy fish. Look at the brown trout. You know, we got brown trout thriving and surviving in 70, 72 degree water. How? We don't know. But, um, you know, it is our responsibility to, you know, be proactive. And I think I think that that's probably the biggest push you'll see over the next 10 years is, you know, anglers taking a harder stance on protecting what they have. Because you have to, and, and and if you don't, it will be gone. Um, and, and again, like this is something that you touched on, you hit the nail on the head. You got to be able to hook that next generation. And the thing that hunting has really dropped the ball on, you know, as society has progressed, you know, you're not getting those kids, that next generation hooked into it. And the thing that I implore for all anglers out there, you know, when you're trying to withhold information about a certain spot, understand that if you, if this is if you're talking to a new person in the sport if they do not have success they will not come back period in story if you have a kid or a mom a mom and a kid like like you know my mom got me involved into it you know if i didn't get hooked on it by catching that first bluegill it was like 10 of them. I remember the first time we went out there, I probably would have been bored with it. And so understand mm-hmm. that if you don't help bring in new kids, new people into the sport, it'll die. And you're not going to have that next generation to conserve this resource. You're, you've, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, it, it takes everyone's um, to continue to build. And I, that's it. You know, the retail level to the conservation level, to the volunteer level. I mean, it, it I don't think people realize how important it is. 
No, they really don't. But you know, Justin, you know, thank you so much for coming on today. Again, everybody, link thank in you. the episode description to everything. So you can go check out one of one of his three great shops. You know, if you're in the Maryland area, we got a shop here right off of 70 that you can go check out. And also we a ton of cool things. And we'll hopefully we'll have somebody back on from his organization in the future. Again, guys, please hit that subscribe button. It really helps us out. We are the fastest growing outdoor fishing show in the greater DC metropolitan area. We'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV. With your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.